long time ago in a church area far, far away, a certain person was involved in a, a bit of an uproar that, that caused a lot of division in the local congregation. And I was asked to get involved to see if I could be of help and sort things out. Well, it turns out a number of people were upset at a certain individual, and that individual was concerned because no one seemed to be friendly, and no one seemed to want to talk to that individual when they came to church. So I asked the people, what's going on? And the response I got back was that this certain person only wished to talk about themselves and how great they were and all the wonderful things that they had done in their life. <laughs> Perhaps you know the type. Have you ever had this? You know, you tell a joke, and someone says, oh, that's nothing, I got a better one. Then they proceed to try to outdo your joke. Or you, or you tell an amusing or poignant anecdote, and when you finish, someone says, oh, that's nothing. Listen to what happened to me. Then they proceed to go on and on and on and talk about themselves. Well, you know, that kind of person is very annoying and seems to be just full of themselves. But what I've discovered is usually that type of person actually feels very bad about themselves. They brag in hopes that others will compliment them or think well of them and, 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 and the belief that that will make them feel better and they deeply desire just to feel better about themselves because they feel worthless. And usually braggadocio comes out of a feeling of self-worthlessness and a desire to make the self feel better. Well, anyway, I talked with a certain person and I explained that I'd heard that some folks were annoyed that they felt that this person uh, turned the conversation to themselves all the time and appeared to be bragging about themselves all the time. And after I explained this gently as a possible reason why this person felt that some of the folks at church were avoiding them, <laughs> didn't seem to want to talk to them or be friendly with them, the person responded, That's impossible! How could anyone think that I, I would brag? How could they think that? Don't they know I'm the humblest person who ever lived? Using my keen gift of discernment, I thought I saw what the problem might be. Well, I tried to help that individual and the congregation, and I hope that I did. But that brings us to our scripture for today. Our scripture for today is about unity in the church and humility, being humble. Now, let's find out what the Apostle Paul says about these topics and how he hoped that what he said would help the Christians in the church in Philippi in his day. And let's note how his words and his instructions can help you and me in our congregations and our local churches today as well. So we're going to look at the book of Philippians chapter 2 and verses 1 through 13. So let's, uh, let's begin in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 1. And what we're going to talk about here is Paul's appeal for unity through humility. Unity through humility. So he begins in chapter 2, verse 1, and I'm going to read a couple of verses, then we'll come back and discuss them more intensely. He wrote, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded and having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. So what's he saying here? 
therefore, therefore what? Well, therefore, really going back to chapter 1, verse 27, where he said, live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Therefore, and we're going to run into several ifs here, but in this case, uh, the, the Greek word might be better understood in English as sense because it, it's an if, but it expects a positive outcome. So I'm going to read sense. Therefore, since you have any encouragement, exhortation or admonition, really, from being united in union with Christ, since any comfort, and here this is a persuasive address, it means uh, an incentive for doing something, a stimulus, any comfort from his love, Christ's love for his church, since any common sharing, we know that Greek word, don't we? Koinonia, fellowship, communion, participation, sharing. If any common sharing in the spirit, sense any tenderness. Oh, the Greek word here is literally intestines. I thought you'd want to know that. If you have any intestines. In other words, if you... you Oh, you know, we talk about bowels of mercy. Oh, ouch, it gets me right here. If you have any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete, fulfilled, by being like-minded, thinking the same way, judging about things the same way, having the same attitude, being one in attitude and heart and mind. Then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit, psyche is the Greek word there, often translated soul, spirit, soul, mind, in one accord. You know, we have, I think, an interesting expression in English that would fit here, soulmate. Being a soulmate to one another. Then in verse 3, he says, do nothing. You know, let me put that in modern English. Don't even think about it. Do nothing out of selfish ambition, pride, strife, factionalism, or vain conceit, empty pride. Don't do anything out of ambition or pride. Now, that's a good warning for the church because uh, I've seen far too many churches and, frankly, far too many pastors get carried away with growing their church how big is my church? And when pastors get together, say, how big is your church? <laughs> my church is bigger. My church is bigger than your church, and we're working on a bigger project. We're going we're to build the church and get more people and more donations and more money and more people sitting in chairs and more and more and a bigger building eventually. Ah, ah. And maybe I'll get my own TV show. Woo, woo. And all of a sudden, ministry becomes a vain and pride-filled path. And that ought not be. So Paul warns them, don't do anything out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility. Humility, value others, esteem others, think of others, value others above yourselves. Now that was a rather startling statement for Paul to make to the church in Philippi, a Roman colony, because it was not common in Roman thought, Greco-Roman thought, or Jewish thought for that matter, to think of humility as a virtue. People boasted. And humility was not what you ought to do. So Jesus' teaching on humility was radical. And here Paul reinforces it to probably mostly Roman citizens or at least people living under the Roman domination that they were to be humble. That came as quite a sh cultural shock for them. Not looking to your own interests, your own things, your own interests, but each of you to the interests to the things of others. Now what interests, what things could he have in mind? Well. Needs, concerns, their value as a person, as a human being. Can you see others 
as made in the image of God who loves them? Can you see another person, even an enemy, or even someone you might think is of low esteem, but see them as a child of God, created in God's image? Wow. That's what we should do. That's a proper attitude and a proper view of life. Now, he begins in verse 5 by saying, here's the basis for this appeal. I've, I've appealed for unity through humility. Now, here's my basis for that appeal. He says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Thank you, NIV. The translators there have added a whole bunch of words to try to explain what the Greek says. If you want to read it a little bit more literally from the Greek, it actually may sound a little bit more familiar because it's closer to the King James rendering. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. Or really better translated, which you have in Christ Jesus. It's the mind of Christ, but you have it by being in Christ. Christ. Paul's, one of Paul's favorite expressions is to be in Christ. And he means in spiritual union. He means in, in a union of the Spirit with Jesus Christ where his thoughts fill your mind. And your mind tunes into his thoughts. And you share a life together. You're in union, spiritual union with Christ. And that's what he's saying is use the mind of Christ. Let that spirit which is in you, follow its lead, follow its guide, follow its urgings, follow its nudgings. In your, and he means it in the church. He's talking about a local congregation in Philippi. In your relationships with one another, have this mind, this attitude. Think the way Jesus would think. And then if you think the way Jesus would think, what's going to happen? You're going to do what Jesus would do. You're going to live the way Jesus would live. Now, beginning in verse 6, we get into a very famous section of Scripture. Well-known, well-loved, well-respected. It's called the Christ Hymn. Now, who wrote the Christ Hymn? Some scholars think it was a traditional hymn that had developed in the early church and that Paul here borrows and uses. Others think that Paul created it and wrote it himself. Some would say, but it has a little different language and some unusual wording. Hey, listen, Paul is no stranger to unusual syntax and strange wording. Uh, those, those are very easy for him to use, but it really doesn't matter. But it's a beautiful hymn, nevertheless, whoever wrote it. I'm going to lean towards Paul. Now, Here's the thing, though. This hymn uses some words in an unusual way. It even uses a word that's very rare in Greek. Now, how do you translate a word in Greek to English that's very rare in Greek? You know how you do it? You make a good guess. That's how you do it. And the translators have done their best to make a good guess at how to translate. However, I want to warn you that when you make a good guess about something, there are always going to be those who say, uh-uh, oh no, I see that word differently. And you have an argument over words. And that has taken place in this beautiful hymn, which kind of mars the beauty of the hymn down to a controversial theological discussion of the meaning of words. And, and not to get too far off track at words, but you know, you only know words by their context. If I said to you, it has bark. It has bark. It has a bark. Okay? It has a bark. What are you thinking? A dog? Or a tree? Or maybe you're thinking of the boat they call a bark. If the, it says it has a bark, and you've got to translate that, good luck. Now, if it supplies a missing word like the dog has a bark, you go, oh. 
If it supplies the missing word, the tree has a bark. Oh, but if that noun is not provided, you've got a guess and you hope that you find it in a whole lot of other contexts so that you can accurately translate and interpret that word. So it's not easy, but we're going to walk through it. I think we're going to see by context, by the context in the hymn and by the context of Paul's theology, I'm going to give you an interpretation which I think is true and right and helpful. And you're free to dispute it. You'll just be wrong. <laughs> okay, let's look at it. I'm going to read the hymn through first because it's beautiful. Now, it's more beautiful in Greek, but even translated in English where it loses some of its meter and so forth, it's still quite beautiful. So listen. Talking about Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Yes, amen. That's a beautiful hymn. All right, now let's look at those words and see what we can understand and how they've been misunderstood by many. So he says, who, talking about Christ Jesus, who being, I'm going to say existing, existing eternally and originally, who being in very nature God. What do you mean very nature God? Greek word here is morphe. What does morphe mean? Generally, in Greek, morphe means the external appearance of something. But again, you've got to look deeply into the context and the theology of the statement. It's done by Christians to honor Christ Jesus. Morphe. Yes, the formal appearance, but the formal appearance, the way you see it as it applies to the internal appearance and nature of the thing, and we might even use the word glory, who being in the very nature of God. Remember what Jesus said? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. What did he mean by that? He meant the nature. Yes, the physical appearance is not as important as the nature that manifests itself in the physical appearance. So Jesus, who being in very nature God. What's Paul saying? What's the hymn saying? Jesus is God. Jesus is God. Now, you know what some people would say from this hymn? Jesus was God. And then he stopped being God. And then he started being God again. Well, we'll look at that as we go through the hymn. Who being in the very nature God, or deity, if you want to think of it that way, he was divine. But he did not consider equality with God, which he had. He had equality with God, an existence identical to and equal to God. He did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Thank you, NIV translators. They've taken, what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight words to translate one Greek word. Now, that should tell you there's a problem with that Greek word. And this is a hang-up for some people. The Greek word here is harpagmos. Now, what does harpagmos mean? Well, it comes from a verb that means to snatch or to seize. And harpagmos is a noun 
And so the literal primary meaning in Greek would be a prize, booty, something stolen. But over time, as we know with words, meanings change and shift. So, yeah, more of a prize or something that you want to hold fast to. And that makes sense because if you read it, Jesus was God, but he did not consider equality with God something to be held on to or seized or coveted as a prize or a treasure and not let go of. Now, if you interpret it that way, I think you're on the right track there. But later as more manuscripts have been found and a greater context for this word has been uncovered, a newer translation has been made available, which the NIV uses, which is something to be used to his own advantage. In other words, it's not just a prize or a treasure, but there's a connotation of something you hang on to so that you can use it for your advantage and your benefit. But let's get at the root here. I would read this as Jesus is God, second person of the Trinity, Son of God, from all eternity, God. But he did not hang on to his glory. He did not hang on to it. Did he let go of his divinity? No. Some would say he did. No. But he did let go of his glory. He did not consider it equality with God, something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. Okay, made himself nothing, three words for one Greek word. A kenosin. It comes from the Greek word kenosis. Now, if you ever study theology, don't waste your time. But if you ever study theology, I say that tongue at you. You'll read about the kenotic theory. And the canonic theory, at least one of them, goes something like this. Uh, there, there was God, and there were three persons in God, and the second person in God, uh, it was decided that he would give up being God and become a human. So he quit being God and became a human and died. But then he was so good that that which remained God turned him back into a God again. Okay, I'm saying that's wrong. <laughs> Just trust me on that. And again, if you disagree with me, that's fine. I accept it, but you're wrong. He did not consider equality because something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. Now, if you want to translate the word literally as emptied, yes. Okay, he emptied. He emptied himself. He emptied himself what? out of a heavenly, glorified form into an earthly and inglorious form. Divine form to a human form. He emptied himself, hear me church, he emptied himself from something, not out of something. From something, but not out of something from an expression of deity, not from the possession of deity. Jesus was still God. He just didn't express it in the glory of God that he once had. Okay? So he made himself nothing by taking the very nature, morphe, external experience, ex external appearance, but reflecting the inner nature of what? Of a servant. Now, do you get Paul's point here? God to servant. Sometimes people get so caught up in the theological argument here that they miss the point. God to servant. Is that humility or what? Wow. Being made in human likeness. Genomalus. Actually, uh, I would better translate that as becoming. And in verse 8, it, the NIV is going to translate it as becoming. So becoming in human likeness. 
And the Greek word there is schema, schemate. Schemata. Similarity to, but not exact. Now, Jesus was similar to humans, but not fully, not 100%. How was Jesus different? He didn't sin. He didn't sin like humans. He had perfect faith, perfect trust, perfect obedience. You don't find that in humans. So he was in every way like a human, except without sin. Being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance, external condition, human form, as a man, here's Paul's point. Are we ready? All the theological debate and argument over words aside, here's where Paul is going with this. Here's Paul's point. He humbled himself. Talk about that more later. God humbled himself. Wow. Something to think about. He humbled himself by becoming, same word again, ganamos, by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Ultimate humbling and humiliation. Therefore, as a result of that obedience and ultimate humbling, therefore God, probably meaning here the Father, exalted. And the Greek might, word might be better translated, super exalted. Therefore God super exalted him to the highest place. Lifted him up, glorified him again, returned him to the glory that he had before he veiled that glory. Exalted him. Now, do you notice the principle here? What precedes exaltation? Humiliation. Humbling. Isn't that a kick in the pants? That before you're exalted, you must be humbled. Wow. But did not Jesus say that? For those who humble themselves shall be exalted. Wow, what a radical cultural shift that was in thinking. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place. Ascension, glorification, resurrection, glorification, ascension. And gave him the name. The name. Now, what's the name? I'm going to guess Lord. Kurios, Lord. It's the Greek term used in the Greek Old Testament for Yahweh. Where the Hebrew says Yahweh, the Greek says kurios, Lord. Jesus was and is Yahweh. Give him the name, Lord, Lordship, Master, Ruler, Sovereign. The name that is above every name. Every authority. He is the master. He is the ultimate ruler. He is the supreme sovereign. That at the name of Jesus, you catch that? Gave him the name, Lord. So that at the name of Jesus, Yeshua, his human name, his human name, at the name of his human name, at the name of Jesus, Every knee should bow. And you only bow to God. Jesus is God. Every knee should bow. In heaven and on earth and under the earth. Now we're getting metaphorical here. You say, well, what things in heaven have knees and what things in heaven don't have knees? Does God have knees? Angels have knees? It's a metaphor. Just roll with the meaning. Every knee should bow. In other words, all rational creatures. There is, among all rational creatures, only one Lord and Master. That is Jesus. Every knee should bow in heaven, spirit beings, departed saints, on earth, living humans, kings, emperors, rulers, whoever, and under the earth, 
referring to the dead, the spirit beings, or whatever. A metaphor. It's a metaphor for Jesus' lordship, for Jesus' cosmic authority over all creation. And every tongue, again, metaphorical, personal beings who have communicative powers. And every tongue should acknowledge, should confess that Jesus is the Lord, the Master, the Sovereign, the Ruler, the Supreme One. Now, every tongue shall confess it, but that doesn't mean they like it. Doggone, they've got to admit it. Like it or not, he is God, Lord, Master, Ruler, Sovereign. Acknowledge that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It fulfills God's purpose and plan. Victory, exaltation, glorification, follow humbly. Isn't that something? That's Paul's point. So if you want to be glorified, you want to be exalted, what do you do? Get humble. Be humble. Humility is the pathway. Now Paul gives exhortation, beginning in verse 12, along the lines of conduct yourself properly according to the gospel of Christ. Therefore, my dear friends, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, and I think Paul here primarily means his teaching, as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, in other words, yeah, when I'm there, yeah, you did what I said, but I want you to do what I say even when I'm not there physically with you. Not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence. You know, what if I never return? Are you going to stay with what I've taught you? Are you going to be faithful? Continue to work out your salvation. Now this causes people. There is another little uh, awkward phrase that people misinterpret. What do you mean work out your own salvation? You mean we got to do stuff to get saved? Yeah, I thought salvation was by grace, not by works. What do you mean work out your own salvation? Well, let's explain it in context. Paul says, do what I say, what I've taught you. Stay faithful. Even if I'm not there, and who's he talking to? A church congregation. We tend to think of this individually. Church congregation. He's saying to the church congregation. Now listen, church congregation. You've done what I've told you. You've followed my instructions. You, you've followed my teachings. You've been faithful. And I want you to remain that way even if I'm not there. But if I'm not there, you know what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to work out, I'm going to say better translated, work at. You're going to have to work at your salvation. Now, what does salvation mean for Paul? Primarily, being in the people of God. You're going to have to work at what it means to be in the people of God. Now, you know the people of God. We are the people of God. We're not always easy to get along with. What are you going to do about it? Work at it. That's what he's saying. Work at it. You're going to have to work at it. I'm not going to be there to help you. You're going to have to work at it. Work at your own salvation. Take responsibility for being the people of God and how you are to conduct yourselves with each other. And yes, you're going to have to stifle yourself sometimes when you start shooting your mouth off. But please do so. Work at it. Work at it with fear and trembling, with respect and humility. That's how you stay unified as a church congregation, as the people of God. Verse 13, for, here's a purpose statement again, for it is God who works in you. Now, there we go. Now, yeah, that's right. That's where the energy, you have that word work, that energy, that drive, that desire comes from, from God. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. So the desire and the energy to respond and do what you need to do, it comes from God. But you've still got to respond and do it. 
and it fulfills God's purpose, his delight, his blessing, his love for his people and community. So what do we learn from the Apostle Paul today? Well, God is all about relationship. Have you ever thought about it? God is all about relationship. Thus, the Apostle Paul exhorts us to understand the importance of the people of God meeting together in community. He also exhorts that community to have unity of mind in Christ, unity of mind and heart. And when the church comes together, it's for the unified purpose of worshiping and glorifying God and sharing in the communion of the Spirit. The worship and communion is lived out how? In living and sharing the gospel. Paul teaches us that this unity is made possible and experienced through our humility as followers of Jesus. Now listen to this. You might want to write this down. We must have unity and community through humility. You like that? We must have unity in community through humility. You say, Pastor Dan, you just could have said that when you got up there and sat down. Well, excuse me. But I hope you will remember that. Unity and community through humility. Now, while humility was not seen as a virtue in Greco-Roman or Jewish culture, <laughs> thank the Pharisees, I thank God that I'm not like other men, like this guy over here. <sighs> humility was taught as a necessary way of godly life by Jesus. And he certainly set that example as our Savior and our Lord. Humility is actually an aspect of the nature of the triune God as we know him. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit pour themselves out into each other. God exists in an eternal state of unity and giving. Consider this. God condescended to make a creation of things and beings inferior to himself and to love them. God did not need to create, but it is his nature to give. Here's, here's uh, something to really consider. It is also his nature to place the needs of his inferior created beings above his own glory. That's what Paul expresses here that we've just read in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 7, which states that the second person of the Trinity, the Son, emptied himself of his heavenly and glorious form to veil himself in an earthly and inglorious form of a servant. He humbled himself and made himself of no reputation. However, that human form was no not just some outer garment, but a real existence in humanity, assumed into oneness with the existence of the Son, who condescended to the human condition and existence. Hear me, church. Though he retained his divinity and all of his attributes, he chose to veil them and not act independently from the Father and the Spirit. Consider this. God is greater than all. God is supreme. God is divine. God is holy. God is the greatest that there is. Can God be said to be humble? You know, the guy said, it's hard to be humble when you're great as I am. Thank God, God doesn't think that way. Can God be said to be humble, or is that only a creaturely virtue? Well, that's a bit tricky, and it depends on how one defines humility and humble. Now, I understand from reading Paul here that true humility should be defined as accurately knowing who you are. Catch that true humility, accurately knowing who you are. As Paul writes, not thinking of yourselves more highly than you ought, but with sober judgment. Thus, not exalting yourself above who you are, but not debasing yourself below who you are. 
Both are wrong. Both are not humility. When you say how great you are and brag, that's wrong. But when you say how low you are and worthless, you're wrong too. Because God loves you. And you're valuable to Him. Don't say you're worthless. But don't say you're the greatest either. Have an accurate knowledge of who you are. Maybe we ought to put it this way, of who you are in Christ. Let your identity be in Christ. Neither exalt yourself nor debase yourself, but live in your Christ-like identity. Humility is an attitude that is more concerned about giving than receiving. Humility is concerned more about serving than being served. As Paul says in verse 4 here, looking out for the interests of others as well as your own. Humility includes a willingness to sacrifice, though, and to serve, to help others. Humility shares. It does not cling to things, to what is its own, but it uses what it has to bless others. It does not cling to what it has, but uses what it has to bless others. Now, who does that remind you of? Jesus. As Paul wrote in verse 8, God and Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to death. I think we can definitely say that God in Jesus has experienced humbling. God in Jesus has experienced humbling. And as we discussed before, you think about it, God, the second person of the Trinity, willingly, obediently, and humbly laid aside His glory and came to us in flesh in our human condition. He came as an embryo. God became a human embryo. He became a fetus. Was, came through the birth canal of a human female. God was a baby wearing diapers. An infant learning to walk and learning to talk. He was a little boy who grew into a 12-year-old who both had great understanding but was also humble enough to ask teachers for more information. He wanted to learn. He had laid aside the use of or he had veiled his omniscience. The all-knowing God laid aside his omniscience to have to learn. Wow. He grew into a man and followed his father Joseph into the carpentry building trade. Did manual labor until the age of 30. Then at 30 years of age, he began his ministry. How did he begin it? By going hungry for 40 days being tested by the devil. Then he traveled the Levant camping out under the stars, walking mile after mile to different cities to preach and teach. What did he get for it? He was hated, persecuted, rejected, mocked, tortured, executed on a cross. And he willingly endured all of that because he valued us more than himself. He valued us more than himself. His comfort, his power, his glory. We were more important to him. Humility, thinking more of others than yourself. Willingness to give up your interest in your things for the interest in things of others. It's the nature of God revealed in the example of Jesus. Since we're to walk as Jesus walked, and we're to utilize and live out the mindset of Christ, and we are to participate in the life of the triune God, what does that mean? That means we must obediently live in humility. We must live in humility before God and others as the Holy Spirit enables us. We must concern ourselves not just for ourselves, but for God and for others. 
And as we live this out, we will experience true community, true koinonia, true community, the unity that God wants us to have. As followers of Jesus, we will experience what Jesus said that he'd given to us, the glory that the Father gave him, that we may be one, just as Jesus and the Father are one. Wow. So someday, we are to be ultimately glorified. What have you learned that means? Since someday we're going to be exalted and glorified, uh, what do we have to do first? Be humble. Humbling always precedes glorification. Since someday we are to be ultimately glorified, today we're to be humbled. Humility always precedes exaltation and is its pathway to it. Let us walk that pathway. Let us walk that pathway as Jesus walked it. And follow him down that pathway. Because that pathway leads where? To glory. To exaltation. To eternity. Let us think like and let us imitate Jesus. And you know why we should think like and imitate Jesus? For Jesus truly is the humblest person who ever lived. Amen.